Jesus Christ is alive. He rose from the dead and that day, that Easter Sunday morning, that first Easter, when Mary and Mary Magdalene and Salome went to the grave expecting to anoint a dead body. They saw the angel sitting there and they said, where is Jesus? The angel said, he is not here, he is risen. Death could not hold him. Christ is alive. He's a living savior. That's the greatest news the world has ever heard. We're gonna go ahead and jump right in to this message entitled, He is Risen. Today being Easter Sunday, we are obviously gonna be talking about the victorious work of the cross, Jesus Christ alive, bringing all of us alive. Let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 24. That's where we're going to spend the vast majority of our time. But remember, we are 2,000 years removed from this story. In fact, just a few days ago, we celebrated Good Friday. And for us, it was Great Friday. For Jesus, it was anything but Good Friday, where he was abused and beaten and mocked and spit upon and nails driven through his wrist and through his feet and a crown of thorn pressed onto his body and clothes ripped off and laid naked in front of uh, the fo his followers, his mom even, and uh, people that he loved dearly. I mean, the, the most excruciating kind of death you could ever imagine was the Roman cross torture and crucifixion. And that was Good Friday. And in that place, the disciples, the followers of Jesus, they saw their hope personified in Jesus die on a cross. And so then they moved to what we know as Holy Saturday, a time of reflection, a time of, of prayer, of waiting. We, we celebrate the waiting where Jesus was in the tomb for three days and while the world was waiting, Jesus was waging war and he was taking back the keys and the authority from Satan. And so all these things are happening, but you find the disciples, they are scattered, they are scared, they are hiding. All of their hopes, their dreams of ruling and reigning with God has been completely completely dashed, and, and now here they are. They have no idea. They don't know, like we know, because we have the Word of God and we have years of understanding this, they don't know that Easter Sunday is about ready to take place. They just find themselves in a broken, terrified place wondering what is next. The garden tomb where Jesus was laid in, it was painstakingly guarded by shifts of Roman soldiers to make sure that no one could go in and steal Jesus' body. Because I'll, I would think the thing, same thing, honestly, if I was them. You got these crazy followers of Jesus, and I know what they're going to do to say that Jesus actually was raised from the dead. They're going to sneak in, they're going to take Jesus' body, and then they're going to call the local news station, get them over here with their cameras in the newspaper and say, see, it was real. We're not crazy. This savior that we filed, he's risen. And so they put armed guards there. They rolled a massive stone. This isn't like something that one or two guys can just pick up and move. A massive stone in front of it. And they sealed the tomb up. And now we break into that story, Luke chapter 24. This is the sum of the followers of Jesus, the women that were most times the most faithful followers of Jesus. Let's go ahead and read in Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And then when they went in, they did not find the body of Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day, be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. 
And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women who told these things to the apostles. Verse 11. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. These angels stood at the tomb where these women were there to anoint Jesus' body for burial. And they were amazed that there was no Jesus. And they were scared, and they bowed down before the angel, and they said, listen, there are some important things happening here. Paraphrasing, of course. Jesus had to be crucified. He had to be delivered up so that in three days he could rise again. So what you're seeing right now, followers, is what was prophesied. And I believe the angels are inviting us to do the exact same thing that they invited those women to do, to look, to gaze upon, and realize that he is not there, but has risen. And that's really what God is calling you to right now. Every one of you, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, it's to take this moment, a pause, and go, okay, is our Lord, our Savior, is he in the tomb or is he not? And we're going to read later that if he's in the tomb, then absolutely everything that we believe and everything that we uh, claim is false and we have no hope. But if it is true that he is not in the tomb, then that has massive ramifications for the world around us and for our own spirits and the rest of eternity. And so the angels invited those women. God is inviting us right now to see that he is not there, but that he has risen. And notice that the women forgot the words of Jesus, forgot the prophetic word, forgot that he already said these things already needed to take place. There was already going to have to be the crucifixion and the burial, and then three days later being resurrected. They forgot that, and how often do we forget the words of God, the message of Jesus that we find in the Bible? And so it, these women were in good company with them, because when things get tough and difficult, we often forget the promises. We forget the good news, which is is called the gospel of Jesus Christ. We forget those things. But when the angels reminded them, they remembered, and they went back to the 11 disciples and all the other people that were there, and they began to share what took place. And notice their response from the followers and disciples of Jesus. They thought that it was an idle tale. And here you have these women coming back, most likely frantic, saying, you won't believe it, you won't believe it. He is not there. The tomb is empty. And they're going, come on, listen, we're hurting right now. You're rubbing salt into an open wound on us. Don't, don't mess with our emotions. Don't, don't tug on our heart right now. This seems like an idle tale, wishful thinking, head in the clouds. And they shared this. And I believe that some of you right now that are watching this, you have the same response. You have the same heart condition. You hear that the God of this universe came here to this earth in the form of a man, lived among us in a perfect ministry, a perfect life of love, and died on a cross so that each one of us could be forgiven of our sins and could be set free. You hear that story of a God that was once dead, but then was raised from the dead in glorious resurrection on Easter Sunday some 2,000 years ago, and you go, that, that's a cute story. I hope it's true. Some of you feel like there's no way that that's true. You, you have the same perspective that the followers of Jesus did, which is it's an idle tale. Boy, wouldn't that be nice if it was true? And by the way, that's not just unbelievers that think that. That's not just atheists, as an example, that would think that that is an idle tale. Oftentimes, even those of us that believe, we get so comfortable, so relaxed in, in our relationship with God and our pursuit of God that we say things like, He is risen. We, he, has, uh, he has taken back the keys 
of the enemy. He has brought life. He has brought hope. And he has brought salvation. And we can say those things in a monotone. It doesn't stir us. It doesn't move us. Because even though we might believe that it's true, it's not deep down belief, down at the very core of who we are. It's thoughts. It's not belief. And it's more of an idle tale to us, a man, that would be awesome if it was true kind of statement versus this is the reality that we live in. This is what God has done. This is the plan of redemption to win back humanity. We were once made an excellent, perfect relationship with God, but then we threw it away for sin. And we lived for thousands of years without a connection to God and without our hearts being made right. And then God in his perfect timing with Jesus came and he provided the solution. The redemptive plan was made real. It's not an idle tale. If that doesn't stir you up, if you don't start getting excited on the inside of you going, man, this is the glory of God. This is the miracle of heaven. This is my heart being made alive because my Savior is alive. If there's not that moment in your heart, even right now, stirring up on the inside of you, you don't have a revelation of this. It's, it's all head knowledge. It's an idle tale up here. It's not a full expression in your heart. I encourage you, just like the angels did to those women, and just as God is doing right now, the Holy Spirit is to take a look for yourself. He's not there. This is real. This is where the rubber meets the road for us as believers. And for those of you who don't believe, this is a defining moment in your life. Are you going to believe in the God of Christianity, Jesus Christ? And are you going to accept him and follow him? Or are you going to go on your merry way and continue to believe it's just another idol? tale, another religious story, another thing to tuck away and maybe pull out if there's an emergency. No, this is real life. The glory of God is upon us and in, in our midst. And I would just say this, when was the last time that you marveled at the miracle of the resurrection, at the empty tomb? Notice that the disciples and all the followers, they just sat back there was one, though, Peter. Oh, I love Peter. Peter's this, you know, kind of loud mouth, sticks his foot in his mouth quite often. He's, he's a lot like me. He's just kind of like the first one to raise his hand, even though he has no idea what's going on. He's, a, he's maybe a little bit over uh, amped up kind of thing. He reminds me of someone that had way too much coffee at all times. Peter's response was not to sit back and go, these women don't know what they're talking about. He stood up and he ran to that tomb. Father, I just ask right now, I just feel in my heart, Lord, that this be a time that we're not distracted, we're not apathetic, we are not doing 25 other things. This is a time right now that we have, that every person that hears us has a Peter anointing over them, Holy Spirit, rush into hearts and lives and living rooms right now that we have a, oh, I've heard that story a thousand times, that we don't have that kind of mentality, but we have a, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to run and I am going to marvel at the miracle of the empty tomb, the risen Savior. And I pray that over every person here that we, we're not just professional believers and Christians, but we are in this very moment in awe of who you are and what you have done for us. I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. This verse is 
combating those that don't believe, those that are skeptical about the empty tomb, about the risen Savior, and they say, listen, here's the thing. You can't have it both ways. And I'd say the same thing for you. As a individual, either believer of Jesus or not, you cannot have Jesus both ways. Jesus cannot be over here as just a really good guy, a great prophet, a wonderful teacher, a, a missionary of love, but not a savior. He can't be that. He is either 100% the risen king, the risen God, or when many people want him to be this good guy over here, this good kind of you know hippie walking around just doing good little deeds, you can't have it both ways. You have to make a decision. In your heart, do you believe that he is what he says he is and who he is and that he truly has the power of life and death and that he has risen himself from the dead and he has risen those that believe from the dead as well? Is he savior or is he not? You cannot have it both ways because what it's saying right here is the God that we serve claimed to be the son of God, claimed to be risen from the dead. And it's what our faith is built upon. It's what we establish our hearts on. And so you can't be wishy-washy about this. This is, again, a defining moment. Where is my faith, my trust in? See, a whole bunch of good men and women throughout history have died for some really good causes, even some great causes. Just dying for a good cause does not equal salvation. If Jesus went through all of that suffering and died on the cross, and that was the end of it, and there were bones and a body and a grave, that would be the end, and there would be no salvation story. And that's what's being said here in 1 Corinthians. Listen, the power of the resurrection is the fact that he was resurrected. The power of our story, the power of God's story and our salvation is that Jesus was raised from the dead. And I know I keep hammering on it and I keep saying that, but the, the reality has to sink into our hearts. He is either king, savior, risen and alive, or he is dead and buried in a grave because every historical document confirms that he died. They have secular uh, writings out there that confirms there was a Jesus and he was crucified at the same way in the same time that it said. And there's also a ton of writing out there, both Christian and secular, that says that he was raised from the dead from eyewitnesses. But even if you removed the raising from the dead, if Jesus died and was in a tomb and never was resurrected, if that was the case, then he was just a really good man that died for a really good cause. But that's not powerful. That doesn't save you and it doesn't change your life. It doesn't bring you into a relationship and into eternity with God. A pers good person that dies for a good cause is still dead. But Jesus, he is alive. It's the power of God. In fact, without the resurrection, the entire story that we find in the Bible is completely powerless to save and set us free. The battle was won on the cross. Jesus paid the price and he sealed and took care of all of our sins right there on the cross. But it wasn't until he was raised from the dead that it became publicly available to us. Think of it kind of like the grants that have been passed lately. And I'm not trying to be political and certainly not trying to uh, bring the story of the resurrection down to the level of, of uh, you know, a multi-billion, trillion uh, bill that was passed. But it was passed, but there's still a lot of people that are waiting to receive their money and businesses that are waiting to get that check as well. It was passed by officials, but we're still waiting for it to become available. Many of us are. The same thing, Jesus Christ paid the, Christ, paid the price on the cross. It was paid for in full then, but it became publicly available for you and I to choose to walk in that on what we know as Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. I remember when my parents shared with me a truth that rocked my world. Now, I know that there are parents watching this, and I know that there are kids watching this, so I will, parents, I promise you, I'll be very careful in how I say this. I remember when I was younger, and I believed in a certain few, um, let's just say, holiday people, <laughs> all right? And around Christmas time, I believed in, like, the beard and you know, SC. You guys know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to say it because there's, but you know what I'm saying, right? I believed in him and I believed in all the other ones too. And I remember when my parents told me, Jerry, we need to tell you something. And they sat me down and they told me that he wasn't real. I was like, what? I mean, it was like, and, but 
my mind starts spinning. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And then I stopped and I got real serious, very calm. And I looked at my, and I said, again, I won't say it because I know who's watching. I looked at him and I said, and then bear in mind, it was Easter. I said, does that mean that the funny isn't real? And they're like, and I remember it was like a tunnel. And I just felt so betrayed and hurt. And like, why did you lie to me, parents? Why did you let me believe this lie? Are you kidding me? What about the tooth fairy? What? And I like started spiraling out of control. I'm telling you what, that made for a really rough 15 years. Uh, my 15 year birthday was pretty rough when they shared all that with me. No, it was a little bit before that. It was maybe like 13. But either way, they went way too long. I don't know when it was, but it was definitely past 10. And my parents let me hang out there way too long, longer than they should have. Shame on them. But I remember hearing that and going, what? It was like my whole world shifted and everything that I knew and everything that I understood didn't make sense anymore. And I was angry. I was hurt. But it shifted things. And I had a brand new perspective. The definition of a revolution is an overflow of a government or social order in favor of a new system. That's what kind of took place when my parents shared that with me. I had this whole world system figured out, this whole order figured out to life. And as a kid, I, had to, I understood what things were and how things worked. And then they completely, like, uh, overthrowing the government in my mind, if you will, completely threw me off kilter, and that's what they did. But so much more than discovering that and isn't real, so much more than that was Jesus. In fact, it says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. And so the world system up into the point of the cross, the way that God had it set in place in order for us to interact with him and him to interact with us was anything that was sinful, mankind, could not be in the presence of God. And so, again, we were brought into this world, created with no sin. We gave all of that up, and we introduced sin into this world. And from the point of Adam and Eve, at the beginning, all the way until Jesus's death on the cross, there was now this sin problem. And it says the wages of sin, the penalty, the payment that needs to be paid for sin is death. And so God, in his mercy, had a plan in place where we could offer sacrifices of animals and goats and different things. And they would be priests that would take care of this and they would atone or temporarily cover our sins, but it was still never fully taken care of. The relationship between mankind and God was broken and was not restored. It wasn't until Jesus came, this revolutionary leader, someone that overthrew the old system and really actually accurately completed the old covenant, not to do away with, but completed the old covenant. But he came in and completely changed the way that it worked, the social order, the way in the system of belief. And no longer it was every time that you mess up, you had to go kill an animal and do a blood sacrifice and hope that God would forgive you. Now, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, the one-time sacrifice of Jesus, we are able to be forgiven. And it doesn't require us in our good works and our best abilities to try to add to that. It only requires us to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and to confess him and believe and confess him as our Lord. In other words, Jesus, I follow you and I believe that you were risen. How, what a great deal that is. Jesus goes through all of his sacrifice and goes through being completely rejected by God and man. And what we have to do is believe and confess that Jesus was raised from the dead and confess that he is our Lord. Man, we, we got the total good end of that stick. And so for us, Jesus is that revolutionary leader. He is the one that completely shifted everything. And let me just make this clear. He did not shift everything just for Christians. You know, if you're an atheist or if you believe in another religion or another uh, God, well, that has nothing to do with me. No, a complete new world order was set in place. And from that point forward, there was only two realities, two people that walked on the earth. There were those that accepted the gift grace or the, the, the gift from God of love and acceptance and salvation 
And in other words, they are saved and they're followers of Jesus, or there are people that have not accepted the gift grace from God. It is saved and those that aren't saved on their way to heaven and those that are not on the way to heaven, but if they were to take their last breath, they would be on their way to hell. And that seems exclusive. It seems like, whoa, you just put me into a corner where I have to make a decision. But remember, it's not you having to do really good things and be a better version of yourself and have your good works outdo your bad works. Jesus says, just believe in me and confess that I'm your Lord. He makes it easy. This is not something that holds people to arm's length, that's exclusive, that he forces you to jump through hoops. Jesus flung wide the door and said, because of my sacrifice, my body stretched out on the cross, because of that, the, the, the stripes are laid upon me. The blood that I shed because of that sacrifice, you are able to believe and accept and follow me as your Lord and Savior. And so too, realities, two people, a decision to be made between those two realities. Do I follow Jesus or do I reject Jesus? So whether people believe in Jesus or not, they have made the decision. What decision have you made? Are you a follower or are you someone that has at this point figured it to be an idle tale? As I said, Jesus is the most significant revolutionary leader in all humankind. The United States was founded in, in a revolt, if you will, was founded for us trying to break free from the tyranny and from the leadership of the King of England. So we kind of had that restless spirit on the inside of us, that kind of rebellious warrior spirit on the inside of us, kind of baked into the DNA and the culture of who we are as Americans. Jesus came in and he did that for the entire world and for every generation for every human being, whether they loved him or hated him, Jesus said, I have made the way straight and I have made it clear. Accept me, believe in me, follow me, and you are forgiven. In an instant, when you believe and when you confess Jesus as your Lord, in an instant, you are completely forgiven, washed of all of your sin, and your past is removed from you, and you now have a future, a hope with God, a relationship with him. What a great exchange. All of my filthiness and brokenness, God, for all of your gifts, for all of your mercy, for all that heaven has to offer. Man, what a beautiful exchange that is. Why would you not? What's holding you back? You want more proof? You want more evidence? You, 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 you got to have it spelled out in front of you? That's an arrogant perspective to think that you, the created, knows more and demands proof from the creator. The proof is, is that Jesus Christ came and he died for us. And while we may not have been there 2,000 years ago, he died for you. He believes in you so much so that he would allow himself to be tortured so that you could be saved. Why would you make, more, why would you make him jump through more hoops? Why would you force uh, there to be more evidence at some point, it is a leap of faith. At some point, you have to choose to believe in what most people think is an idle tale. But the alternative is terrible. All the other belief systems out there, all the other options, all the other gods that are just fake gods, all of them, they don't offer you anything like what Jesus does. They, they, don't, they don't wash away anything. They don't give hope and, and, and joy. They require you to have your best foot forward. And maybe, just maybe, if you live enough lives or you do enough good things, you'll figure it out. We don't serve an angry God. We don't serve a God that hates us. We serve a God that loves you and me deeply. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 through 15. And you who were dead in your trespasses. Again, this is, this is what we were before uh, we accepted Jesus and before Jesus came here on this earth to die for us. You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us of all trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Notice that he said that the canceling the, legal, canceling the debt, the record of debt that's against you, he nailed that to the cross. This 
record that Satan had against you. The word tells us that he is the accuser of the brethren. Think of like a prosecuting attorney, someone who has all the dirt on you, someone who knows every single thing that you've done. And he, every time that you stand before God and say, God, help me, he stands there and says, hold on, God, don't you realize that this is what they've done? That's what Satan does. He has a document of you, of everything that you've ever done, every mistake you've ever made, every thought you've had, every word you've said, every action you've done, and he has lies that he speaks over you. And there's many different lies. I have some of them, some of them here, that you're useless, you're a mistake, you're a sinner, you're broken, you're unloved, you're evil. There's no future for you. You're full of pride. You're full of fear. You're immoral. You're self-centered. You're, un, you're not forgiven. You're a failure. You're a depraved mind. You're addicted. You're lazy. You're a liar. And so many more things. This is what the enemy says over us. This is what he proclaims. He stands as a judge and as a jury and as the prosecuting attorney trying to get us to be ensnared and be burdened by the sin that's in our lives. And the reality is, is, is a lot of this stuff, it's true. We've done these things. We've thought those thoughts. We've acted this way. But even in all of this, Jesus says, hold on. I took care of that at the cross. He took the record, the shredder right here, he took the record that was against you and I, full of truths and full of lies. He took that record that Satan held against you and he took it and he nailed it to the cross. Just like a shredder takes it and removes it and annihilates it. So there's no way to ever see that again. That's what Jesus did for you and I. He took that record and he erased it. He removed it. Aren't you thankful? I know I am. That Jesus did not stop at justice. See, the reality is God's not fair. And I'm thankful that he's not. If God was fair, this document that the enemy holds over us would still be in our lives. If God was fair, he would look at this and he would read through it and he would go, you know, that's right. I, actually, I remember that. He did that. That's right. This is how this person thinks. This is what this person does. And this document would be handed to God and he would say, I am a just God. The penalty for sin uh, for sin is death, and therefore what you deserve and what I deserve, the justice of our list is death. But again, Jesus took that, he took that record, and he destroyed it. There's no way once that's destroyed to put it back together. I mean, I guess some of you could say, I'm going to tape it and I'm going to put it all back together. But Jesus, what he did was far more permanent. It is removed. It is far as from the east as from the west. It is forgotten. I'm so thankful that God did not stop at justice because we would get what we deserve, which is death, because we are sinful. Jesus went past justice. He went to mercy. Mercy, he gave to us unmerited favor, gave us grace, and said, you are unable to do this by yourself. You can't cancel your debt. You can't erase it, so I'm going to do that for you. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, we already read that the wages of sin is death, but then it goes on to say, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so there it is. We have the penalty for sin, which is death. But because of Jesus on the cross, nailing and shredding that, we have been given a free gift of God, eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I love that. But here is the problem. It's not with God. He's already taken care of it. He's already provided for you. Here's the problem. It's us. There's some of you that are not followers of Jesus, some of you that have made a decision not to follow Jesus, or maybe you never even knew about him. This is the first time you've heard about it. Well, right now, you're not saved, and you're not on your way to heaven, and you are, you are someone that is trying to hold on to the scraps and to the shreds of what Jesus took care of. So Jesus, on the cross, 
he took care of all of our sins and all of that record. But what we try to do is go back into the trash heaps of our lives and we try to remind ourselves and oftentimes remind other people that this is really who I am. This is what I've done. And there is no way that there's a God that loves me that really took care of this, that really did this. And Jesus is going, why are you bringing this up? I forgot about this. I destroyed this. I nailed this to the cross. Why is this something that you are keeping between me and you? And for those of you that are not saved, I'm telling you right now, you may be holding on to that list, but God is not. It was already paid for on the cross. Don't hold on to this as a comfort blanket, as something that gives you, that gives you or protects you or seemingly protects you because you think, at least this is known. I understand how messed up I am. And so I'm going to hold on to this. Trusting a God that loves me and following after him, that's unknown. I'm not sure if I want that. Today is the day to release this, to not pick it up, to say, God took care of it. I'm done with it. I am not going to carry this any longer. And there are some of you here that are already saved, but you keep trying to do the exact same thing. You keep trying to go, hey, God, do you remember? Do you remember? I, I did this. I'm not worthy. Why do you forgive me? Why do you call me? Why do you position me? Why do you gift me? God, 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 don't you remember? Listen, believer, stop doing this. You're making a mess out of things. God set you free. Don't spit on the cross. Don't undermine the power of the resurrection. Remember your records have been erased, have been shredded, have been removed, and it is only God standing there saying, come to me, come back to me, love me as I have loved you. God has not made it difficult. He's not put walls and barriers. He has invited every single one of us to come after him, to trust him, and to know that he is with and for us every step of the way. And I believe that is what God is doing for you right now. And I believe that's what the Holy Spirit, God himself, is speaking to many of you right now. The question is, have you marveled at the tomb? Have you marveled at the fact that he is risen? Have you been, are you someone that has wrapped your faith, your belief around the God that has finished that work on the cross? Or are you someone that believes it's an idle tale? And let me make it really clear again for those of you believers, it is entirely possible for you to be following Jesus, but be acting and living like you believe it's an idle tale. It's called being a practical atheist. You say you believe in Jesus, but you live like you don't. We need to come home. We need to surrender, ask for forgiveness, and come back to God. He loves you. He's not mad at you. So I'm just going to ask right where you're at right now, if you would just close your eyes, everyone, just no, more, no noise, no moving around. Just take a few more moments. I want to pray for you. Now, I can't see you, but you know that this is a time between you and God, a holy moment. And right now, if you're here and you are listening to this and you are a believer and you would say, you know what? I have acted more like the rest of the disciples and I have not been the run like Peter that has ran after God. I, I, have, I have lived a life almost separate from God. I've not been passionate. I've not pursued God with everything, but I want to. I want to come back and I want to be someone that is passionately on fire for him once again or maybe for the first time. Again, if you're a believer and you're saying, I am ready to recommit my heart, to re-come back to the place of, of abandonment and running after God and being those that are wrapped up in his arms, that that's you. With just a physical action for what you are, the decision that you're making, would you just raise your hand right wherever you're at? I know it might seem weird by, by yourself or with your family, but if you're like, listen, I'm a believer and I'm coming back home and I'm recommitting my heart back to God, just raise your hand right now. God sees your heart. God sees that hand and he is for you. He is accepting you back. He is not mad at you. In a moment, we're going to pray together and it, it'll be a, a, a new life, new wind, new passion being breathed back into you. And maybe you're listening to this right now and you're going, you know what, I'm that person that 
does not believe in Jesus or hasn't, hasn't up to this point for whatever reason. Maybe I've rejected him. I pushed against it. I wanted a whole bunch of evidence. Maybe you've never heard about Jesus in the first, this is the first time. But you know with the things that I've said and most importantly with what God himself, the Holy Spirit has been, it's like a tug on your heart, a nudge going, he's talking truth. Listen to him. This is a God that loves you. If that's you and you're like, I am ready to put my hope and my trust in Jesus Christ. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Would you be so bold to do that right where you are at? Keep that hand up for just a second. God knows your heart. He sees that hand. It says this in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, in other words, you say with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, it's the resurrection, it's the empty tomb, it's the running like Peter to marvel, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So everyone... Whether you're a believer recommitting your heart or you're a non-believer saying, I believe now and I am all in. Let's pray this together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you that you sent your son, Jesus, to live on this earth as an example of that love, to die on a cross to forgive me of my sins and to be raised from the dead so that I might experience new life. Jesus, I trust you. I believe in you. I know that you were resurrected and I choose to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' mighty name, A. Man, listen to me. This is so important. If you prayed that for the very first time, that is the most important decision you will ever make in your entire life. Again, this is the, the two realities. You either follow Jesus and run after him and are saved or you reject Jesus. Well, you just chose to accept him and to believe in him. And the word tells us that when just one person does that, that all of the angels in heaven are rejoicing. So whether you're by yourself with a whole bunch of people or not, you have got, you have the multitudes of heaven rejoicing with you. I rejoice with you. This is the most powerful decision. It has translated you out of darkness into light where once you were dead spiritually even though you were breathing you were physically alive you were dead spiritually you are now spiritually alive and whether you feel anything or not I remember when I made a decision to follow Jesus I didn't necessarily feel anything but we have the promise from God that says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead it says you will be saved. Not you might be, or we'll see, or man, I kind of hope so, fingers crossed. It says you will be saved, which means regardless of whether you feel it or not, right now, you are saved. And if you were to take your last breath here on this earth right now, in an instant, you would spend the rest of eternity in heaven with God. That is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Yes and amen.